that thing. Um, I hope everybody had a good Labor Day weekend. Um, a real quick update um, to the Canvas page. So um, on here now, let me go into the student view so I can see what you're seeing. Um, so I put the recorded lectures um, here. I just made a table. Um, and I'll just add to this as, as we go along. Um, so yeah, these just bring you to a YouTube playlist for the class. Um, and so um, if any of you missed like last, last week's in particular um, uh, lectures, they're up. And just as a reminder, the first one was a, um, a Unix shell software carpentry lesson. And then um, last Thursday, there was the kind of a, a side demonstration of like, hey, you know, if you need to rename thousands of pages or files simultaneously, here's how you can chain together some bash commands. And really the purpose of that was just to give you an idea of like, why are we doing this, right? Why are we doing this bash thing that, that seems um, old school and perhaps less, um, less intuitively useful than some other things? And, you know, the, the hope there was to give you at least some behind the scenes like this is where you might use some of these skills um today um we will definitely be delving into skills that you will be learning throughout the class and indeed your first programming programming assignment um will be using git and github um to create a, a, a repository that you'll use for the remainder of the the class this semester. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to go through this. Well, we started going through the um, the version control with Git software carpentry lesson. Um, again, um, we read a little bit about automated version control. Um, we went through this setting up Git. Um, so today, what we're going to do, like I said, is, is go through the process of creating a repository, tracking changes, exploring our history, and ignoring things, hopefully. So we're, we're going to hopefully get through these items. Um, what I will do is, so the remotes in Git, I never just realized, I never sent that Google form seeing if folks, when folks would be interested in sort of a, a, a pizza computing thing. I'll do that today. Um, but in that, we would cover working with remotes in Git, which is where Git all of a sudden becomes very powerful because it's not just about tracking the version history on your own computer. It's about backing that code up somewhere. Okay. Um, so we'll be starting here with this creating a repository lesson. Um, the one caution I have about this particular software carpentry lesson with GitHub is it's kind of cheesy. Um, like it's it's very contrived, but it's fine. Um, we, we will kind of go through the the way that um, that we use it. So so we'll go through this. Um, so uh, go ahead and maybe for the next three, because I have to actually go back through and set up my, I have to go back through and do the um, the the setup for the Git lesson. Um, so maybe read through the um, read through the description and look at the the characters, the cast of characters for our play today. And um, I'll get my uh, version of Git for Windows open. Um, go ahead and and open a terminal. If you're a Mac or Linux person, um, open Windows for Git for Windows. If you're a Windows person, um, I'm going to show this now to all of the monitors. Um, and then put your blue flags up if you still have them when, when you've done that.
Okay, and then um, by show of hands, are there regular Git users in here? Okay, just a few. Um, the semi regular. Is there any? So, for whom is this completely new? Okay, a, a good chunk of, and it's a good refresher, right? I even sort of like it's good for me to come back to these things. Um, so, I actually like teaching this this lesson. Um, so, the the thing about Git, right? The the backstory behind Git, and I think I mentioned this last time, right? There were all of these other kinds of different pieces of software, different pieces of code that originally existed for doing version control. Subversion and CVN were kind of the, the most common in the like early 2000s through like the early 2010s. The urban legend has it that um, Linus Torvald, is, who's the person that refactored the original Unix kernel to create Linux, created like didn't like any of those ver version control softwares um, and so he so he supposedly created git in a weekend um, and so you know you can sort of see that in like some of the commands are a little weird right and a little bit the process but um but the thing about git is that um there's really basically only kind of four commands that, um, four or five commands that we will use consistently that, that really, you know, form the basis of maybe 80% of the things that you will do in Git, right? Um, those are Git status, Git add, Git commit, Git push, Git pull. I might add Git clone in there, right? But if you add Git clone, that brings you up to like 90% of the things that you do, okay? So it's there's there's not a lot out there, but it's the the process and the order in which you do things can be can be very important, right? Okay. So first off, um, let's uh, create a a directory, right? So where am I? I am. Uh, I'm going to go to documents. Um, you can go to desktop. Um, and let's create a directory that's called planets. So the, the bash command for that is mkdir for make directory. And I need to specify that the name of that directory will be planets. Okay, so um, let's now navigate into planets. Okay, and um, this is, right, we just, we literally just created this directory, this folder. Um, so I want to list the contents of this folder, but I'm expecting the contents to be what? Nothing. And how would I list, how, what's the command in Bash again for listing the command, listing the contents of a folder? LS, right? So I'm gonna type LS. And indeed it's going to return to me nothing, right? I also can sort of just make sure I'm where I think I'm supposed to be, right? And that in this case is, is C, users, Leho Flores, documents, planets. So I'm, I'm where I think I am for one, for two, I just created a folder. And for three, there's nothing in this folder as I would expect, okay? So I want to create a Git repository, right? I want to create um, this, this magical thing that is going to allow me to store my code, to keep track of what version I'm on on my code, to, to manage how I make changes to the code, right? So that if something bad happens, I can always revert, right? Or um, I can use my code elsewhere, right? So I want to create this magical thing that's called a Git repository, even if I don't know what all of the all of the magical things that come along with Git are, right? So the way that we do that is just by typing Git init. 
Okay, so this returns and says, I initialized an empty Git repository in C colon forward slash users, Lejo Flores, documents, planets, forward slash dot Git. Okay, so now if I type list again, if I list the contents, it shows nothing, right? Um, but if I type ls and pass list the minus a flag or switch, right? A stands for all. It's going to show me now that there's this thing called dot git and both the color and the forward slash are gonna indicate to me that this is a directory, okay? Okay, so it did something. What is in this directory now? Um, I'm going to navigate into it as I would any other directory, right? And so what was the special thing about um, files and directories in bash that started with a period? What was special about them? They're hidden, right? So an ordinary ls command wouldn't show it to me, but if I coerce, if I force bash, into telling me everything that's in it with a minus a flag, it will say, okay, I relent. I will tell you what, what all of the hidden folders are. Okay, so git is just a folder or dot git. Dot git is a folder. The dot indicates that it's hidden. And why do we hide things again from users using the period? Yeah, just so that we don't delete it, right? Like the, the philosophy is that by adding the, the period, the dot in front of the name, and by hiding that and not seeing it, you're less likely to accidentally delete it, right? Um, you can intentionally delete it, and I will at some point just to show you kind of how this works. Um, um, but... Um, um, but I'm less likely to kind of accidentally mess something up, okay? Now, by navigating into this, by using the dot, the cd command, so I can just type cd dot git and tab complete, and bash is more than happy to let me enter it, okay? Um, I am now, right, I'm maybe starting to be in the danger zone a little bit, right? So if I type list, if I type ls again, maybe I can use that minus one switch to give me everything in a, a, a single column. Um, I have this file called head. I have this file called config. I have this thing called descriptions. And then I have four folders, hooks, info, objects, refs, okay? Um, So when I use git init, it created all of these things. And I don't know what any of them are, right? I have no idea what head means, right? I'm assuming that that means like the top of my repository, right? Um, config is maybe, right? Maybe I can say, you know, um, tail config and it'll, tell me some things, right? So it's got, this is just a text file. It's got some things in here that I didn't set, but it gets set by default. Um, maybe if I go into this folder objects, um, there's two more folders beneath this, okay? Um, but what I want to tell you now, right, and what's really important is that we never want to be, we never need to be really navigating into our dot .git folder and doing anything, right? So our dot .git folder is just where stuff is going to be stored, and git will do all of this for us, right? So the reason this folder is hidden is to try and prevent us from messing something up with our code repository. But it's also because things are stored in here in a very particular way that, that Git set up, 
right? Presumably there's nothing in my repository right now, but presumably Git is going to make use of this structure that it just created, right? So it created this whole tree of files and folders, and I don't want to mess with any of them, right? So, so that's one thing is, is to tell you, right, this is kind of like a really good or an analogy. I don't want to say really good. Some of my analogies are horrible. Right, an analogy for this, right, is taking like an old school desktop computer and like ripping off the side and just looking into the, the computer, right? It's got chips and some of those are soldered together. Others are just kind of like, you know, cabled in together. It's got stuff, a fan that's wired in somewhere, right? The computer is designed to make those things all work in concert with one another. And I presume that all of that is in there for a reason, right? So I don't need to mess with anything inside the Git folder, right? Um, all I really care about, if I back up here to where I'm a little bit safe, right, is that in fact, my .git folder exists, okay? Now, another thing to do, right? So this also is a helpful thing right, when looking around in somebody else's code, right? If somebody hands you a thumb drive and you plug it in and copy a folder from their thumb drive to your desktop or laptop, hopefully it's, hopefully you know where this thumb drive came from, right? It's something called OPSEC, Operation Security. Don't be plugging random thumb drives into computers. Um, one not unwise thing to do would be to type an ls minus a in that folder and say, hey, is this if this person's is this a git is this a git directory that they just gave me? Right. Um, so if you're navigating around and looking for things, you can tell if something was or is a git repository by typing ls minus a. And if you see dot git, right, you will you will reveal that in fact this piece of code is under version control or was under version control somewhere. And now you have it access to that version control system, okay? Which is good, okay? We'll show why in a few. Okay, um, now what I wanna, you know, okay, so, so big deal. So I've created, so I've created a, a GitHub repository. Now I wanna actually do something useful with it. Um, another one of the commands that we'll use um, less often, but we'll use it is one called checkout, right? And I want to say minus B space main. Okay. Okay. So what did this do? Um, so uh, this is one of those commands that I find a little weird in that like, the, the elder millennial Gen Xer in me has like a couple of different contexts for the word checkout, right? Um, one is like checking out a library book and the other is like, hey, check this out, right? Like check it out. Both are kind of valid contexts for Git checkout, right? What I just did is I checked out, right? Or I'm looking at, B is for branch, right? A new branch called main. So what I told GitHub, or I'm sorry, Git, I'm gonna make that mistake tons of times. Um, what I told Git was, hey, I wanna check out, I wanna create a new branch and I wanna call it main, right? And, and Git assumed that you want to switch to that new branch main. Branches are gonna, Branches are a very useful um, tool in Git, which we won't come back to until later, because what they do is they provide us a way to make different versions of the code or different, um, one, one particular use for branches, right, is if I have several people working on the same piece of code, in order for them to not conflict with one another, right? In order for them to be able to do their own thing, 
without having to wait for anybody. They can each create their own branch and then we can worry about merging those branches later, right? And we can do that in a sort of coordinated way, right? So branching becomes very useful for keeping kind of different versions of your code that are sort of in different status of development, right? So a main branch would be something that's like, hey, you know, this is up, this is the main thing. This is the thing we're pushing out to people that we want them to use. And then you might have another branch that's like dev for development, right? And that one's like, hey, this has some new, cool, potentially useful features, but it might not work, right? Similarly, this might be like a branch Leho and a branch somebody else, right? Where we're working on our own code independently and we're not messing up the main branch, right? So none of the changes we're making are gonna screw up the piece of code that thousands of other people are depending on, right? But at some point, if we create something really cool, we can do what's called merge that back in. Okay. So this is kind of a best practice is to create a branch when you first initialize um, a Git repository, but some of the more advanced features are something that we won't cover for a little bit. Okay. Okay. So now what we want to do is use that kind of first big command that I mentioned we were going to use in Git, and that is Git status. And Git status returns and says on branch main, which is we just created that branch. It says no commits yet, right? which I don't know what that means just yet, but I don't think I committed anything. So that seems legit and nothing to commit, right? So we haven't added anything to our repository yet. So obviously there's, there's nothing to commit to our repository, okay? Okay, so now we're just, you know, what we told, what we asked Git to do was, hey, tell me the status, where am I at, right? Git status, and it will return to you kind of different messages to tell you kind of what's going on. And, and we're gonna come back to it, right? So git status is always kind of like a safety command, right? It's always a command you can, you know, it's only, in, it's only potential outcome is that it spits out for you and says, hey, some, you know, here's where you're at, right? Like that's all it does. If you're ever stuck someplace or you're not quite sure what to do next with git, Git status is always a is always a very safe thing to do, right? It's actually like a really good habit to get in saying, "Hey, git status," because sometimes it'll tell you, "Hey, there's a there's a new version that you need to pull in before you should do anything," right? Um, so git status is our kind of catch-all command. It's like a what we call it in public speaking a disfluency. It's like an um, right? Like git status, git status, okay. Okay, all right, so, okay. Um, I will let you all read through this places to create Git repositories and this correcting Git init mistakes, okay? And then we're going to move on to the next item. So put your blue flags up when you're through reading these. Yeah. Yeah. Let me come back to that.
Okay, I want to do a quick like think pair share with the people at your table. This is not in the software carpentry curriculum, but it's a really good question. So the question that I want you and your partner to discuss is should we create Git repositories in places like a Google Drive folder or a Dropbox folder? So think about that for like a minute. And then discuss with your table mate. Or Jerry, you can just turn around and you could be a three. And then we'll discuss this as a class, right? We'll share out. Okay. Okay, so it's good that I'm hearing lots of discussion, right? Because that, that maybe means that there's not like, who feels like they didn't come to a definitive answer? Okay, um, what would be, right? Why do we keep, why do we keep things in like Google Drive or Dropbox? Let's start with that as like a baseline. Why do we use those things? So-called, yeah, Kachinga? Just for storage. Just for storage, right? And and. And what about what is it nice about having that storage? Like, what does that mean if I'm moving between computers? Exactly, right? Like, it's it's in principle on any of those computers, right? Or I can access it on a ram on a random computer by logging into the web interface, right? What happens? What if I have, as I do, a laptop that I use here at work? and a Mac mini at home, when I'm working here during the day and I'm updating like a manuscript or, you know, something else, 
and that's saved on Google Drive, what's happening? What, what in principle happens? Like, should, shouldn't I be able to pick, isn't the idea that I should be able to pick up where I left off yeah. when I get home and without having to do anything, right? Okay. So in principle, the, the power of Google Drive and Dropbox, Dropbox, yeah, um, are that uh, it's updating, it's changing, it's incorporating the changes I make on one computer onto the files on another computer. That's also dangerous though, right? Okay, so who feels like they came up with uh, some kind of an answer to that question? Should I use Git? Can I put a GitHub Git repository on in a Dropbox or a Google, Google Drive folder? First of all, who came up, who, let's see by show of hands, like who thinks that is maybe not the best idea? Okay, all right, does somebody wanna share out why that is? Anybody? Just like intuitively, we think that's not a good idea. Any thoughts? I think just because it was, as you stated, Google Drive on the GitHub, they're both, you can save files. So you don't see the need of why you can just in the repository on the Google Drive and also maybe accessing it. I think it might be a challenge. Yeah, so right, it, you're getting close to it, right? Which is this idea that it, when it comes to tracking changes, right? Like Google and Dropbox are kind of automated at that, right? And maybe sometimes automation is not like automation. There's good automation, there's bad automation, right? Yeah. Any other thoughts about that? Yeah, so this is getting close, close to it too, right? Which is that Right, one of those is auto, right? Google Drive and Dropbox are automated, right? Um, and as we will see, just because we save a file in our Git repository does not mean it is under version control. That's one of the first things that we will see, okay? And so what's, what, what can happen, right, is that I save a file on my laptop, I don't commit the change, that file is automatically updated through Google Drive on my home computer, but also not committed to change. But then I, I commit the change over here. And then without thinking, I commit the change over here. And now I have a conflict, right? So it's true that Git and Google Drive and Dropbox are, are trying to accomplish a lot of the same things but they're trying to do it in very different ways, right? And Git is, is not an automated thing, right? So that's one thing that we need to remember is that Git is, is, is not going to automatically update, those, update our code base and incorporate those changes. So that's kind of a bummer because it doesn't do it auto automatically. But by not automating those things, it gives me very good control on exactly when things do get incorporated into the code base. And it gives me a good way to decide elsewhere when I wanna pull those changes into that repository, okay? Okay, so we'll start now by adding some things um, and changing some things in our Git repository. And this is where this is where this lesson starts to get a little cheesy, okay? So, okay. So we want to create a file in our repository. So make sure you're in this repository, planets, okay? And you want to use whatever text editor you want. If you're using Git for Windows, Nano is installed. It's pretty easy. 
um, to use and you can follow along with me. That's what I'll use because that's what's in the, the lesson. Um, if, you, if you do decide you want to use them, that's cool too. Um, I'm happy to help out with that. Also totally fine to open Notepad or whatever kind of windowed text editor you're using. Just make sure it's saving in, um, in, in Unicode and not rich text format. So that's kind of an important distinction, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna create a file. The file is gonna be called mars.txt, okay? And this is, if you're following the storyline here, um, I think this is notes about the red planet suitability size, right? So if you if you remember, this is, I think this is Dracula making the notes. Um, okay, so nanomars.txt, nanospace mars.txt is going to create the mars.txt file and it will open the nano editor. Okay, so I'm now in nano version 5.1.6 and I'm in mars.txt. If you look down here, the little caret symbol here is the control key. So if you hold down um, uh, control O, that'll write out, that's like saving. Um, and control X is, is exit. So those are the two commands that I'm going to use the most in nano. And so I wanna input this text. I wanna make note that Mars is cold and dry, but everything is my favorite color. Okay. And I will click Control O. And um, I just hit enter. So wrote two lines. I had an extra return in here, so that's fine. And now I want to exit. So I'll click Control X. Um, and I want to verify, in fact, that that text is in the file, right? And you can, from the command line, use this command cat. Um, I think that's short for concatenate. Um, you can also use tail, you can use head, you can use more. I will just say cat mars.txt. And indeed, it says uh, Mars is cold and dry, but everything is my favorite color. Okay. So now what I want to do is again, um, so the only thing that we did is we created a new text file and we added some text to it. There's, there's literally nothing else that we did, okay? Right now, um, this file is not under version control, um, but what was that command again where we could sort of ask Git to tell us where we're at? Git status, right? So we're gonna type git status. And this time it's gonna say something different, right? It's gonna say on branch main, we didn't change the branch, no commits yet. That seems to jive because I didn't, I don't think I committed anything, but now it says you have some untracked files, right? And it says mars.txt and it's in red. Okay. And it says nothing added to commit, but un untracked files are present, right? And so what Git is telling us here is, hey, something has changed in your Git, in the directory where your GitHub repository is, and I'm not tracking it right now. So this is on you, right? Like I, you, are, you are in the danger zone that here, right? So even though your file is saved, Right, even though it is what we think it is, Git is like, I'm not, I don't know what this is, right? Okay. Um, it says you can use Git add to track, right? And there's two ways of doing this. 
we can type either git add and, and type mars.txt to explicitly add this file to, to git's tracking, okay? Or I can just use the period and that will commit any untracked files, right? In this case, we only have one untracked file, but sometimes, right, you, you'll work on a couple files simultaneously, or you'll make one change in one file and be like, oh, I need to update something in that other file, right? So this allows us to update all of those files simultaneously or track all of those files simultaneously. Um, so it's uh, LF will be replaced by CRLF in Mars.txt. Yeah, this is a Windows thing. Um, I think it's a line continue, but whatever. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so so now what do I want to do? Check the status. Yep, good. Get status. Okay, so now it's an on branch main again that jibes no commits yet. Changes to be committed. Okay, so wait a second. We just added the file using git add, but now git is telling us that we haven't made any commits and that changes need to be committed, okay? So this is something in the git terminology that kind of, um, uh, where folks kind of can get hung up sometimes, right? Is this, this contrast between adding something and committing it, okay? So what we did when we added mars.txt or any files, that process is what we refer to as staging, where we stage those files for being committed. And the mental model I like to use here, right, is like, um, is like a warehouse loading dock, right? So when something is staged, right, it's on a pallet, it's wrapped in cellophane, and it's on the loading dock, right? So it is staged to go into our repository, which is our truck, right? Now, when we commit it, we are pushing it into that truck, right? So it's a two-step process. Can, is there, is there any reason that folks can think of why separating this into a two-stage process might be good, even though it adds another step, and bearing in mind that there's kind of a hint on the screen. Can I remove something from staging? What's it say? Right get rm minus minus cached space file to unstage. So I'm gonna try that, right? I'm gonna say get rm cached mars.txt. And so it said remove get, it, re, it remove mars.txt. Does that mean it deleted my file? No, it didn't delete my file. If I type cat, oops. The content is still the same, but what's the git command I should type now? Yeah. Git status. And now it says it's back to being unstaged, right? So if I type git add again, okay. So I can unstage files. Can anybody think of a circumstance in which that might be helpful? Yeah, Jerry. If something that you have there isn't complete, the doc, you didn't want that to be added. Yes, that's right. Something is like a work in progress, and I just, rather than listing all the files I wanted to add, I hit dot, right? And maybe that might be intentional, right? I mean, say I updated 40 files, but there's 42 files that have changed. And I'll add all 42 and just pull off the two that I don't want changed, right? So that's one circumstance. Another is, and this will come up in how to ignore things. Um, 
what if I'm Leho Flores and I'm analyzing like huge WARF files that are like 15 gigabytes a piece and there's like a hundred of them, right? Is Git the best place to be storing data? Probably not, right? I might not, but it might be in my directory because I might be working with that data, right? So I might type git add period, and then it may say, okay, you added a whole bunch of netcdf files. And I'll go back and be like, that is not what I wanted to do. <laughs> I need to tell Git how to ignore those netcdf files, right? Okay. So there are some circumstances in which we might stage things and immediately figure out that we need to unstage them. Okay. And we have this kind of, um, this mechanism being able to do that. Okay, so we've added git, or we've added mars.txt. Now we actually wanna go through and commit that change. We wanna finally commit the change to our repository, okay? And so the command is git commit. And one thing that git is always going to force us to do is include a commit message. Right, and we're going to tell Git what that message is by passing it the minus M flag and enclosing a message, a commit message in quotes. Okay, so being that this is the first commit, what might be a good message? First commit, right? Let's say first commit. It's almost universally what the first commit is, right? So when we do this and we type enter, it's going to say, okay, main root commit, first commit, here's my message, right? Um, and then take a look at this thing. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven characters, alphanumerical, okay? Who else also has AFBDD42? Okay. Compare with your neighbors real quick. See what characters you have. Okay, how many of you had something that was the same as your partner? Nobody, right? Okay. All right, so this is this is one of the powerful things about Git and why it works. If you're into blockchain, this is like similar to blockchain, right? Um, so this is only part of a much longer what's referred what's referred to as a hash. Right, so there is a long git hash, and this is a unique. I don't remember how many bits or bytes this is. This is a unique string of alphanumeric characters that is an identifier for your particular commit. Right, this one commit is so special that it gets its own like hash. Right, but so now what's nice about these is that these hashes, because they're unique and because they're tied with a commit message, provide us a window into where we're at in terms of our updates, right? And we'll see that, we'll see that in further down in the lesson, okay? But I wanna stop and, I wanted to stop and sort of mention that this is not just kind of some random set of, well, it is a random set of, characters, but it's a very special set of random characters that uniquely identifies this particular commit, right? And is tied to that message and is tied to this version of our code, our first version of mars.txt. Okay, now what do we wanna do? Get status. Okay, all right. So on branch main, that's good. We didn't do anything with the branch. Nothing to commit, working tree clean, right? That means that you are up, you are up to date, right? There's nothing new here. 
There's nothing unexpected. Um, so this is good, okay? So we've now gone through that full cycle of creating some content, mars.txt, adding that or staging that for commit and committing it. And, inter and so those commands respectively were get add, get commit, and interspersed in all of those was what? Get status, right? Okay. So another thing that we can do is um, we can type in this GitHub repository, we can just type git log, okay? Um, and there's only, right, um, there's only one entry here. This is my commit log, right? So it makes sense that there's only one commit. And in there as well, it, it tells me, okay, this is that longer sequence, right? This is the full hash. You saw the first seven or eight digits of it, depending on what Git decided to, to show you. But this is its full kind of however many characters that is, right? You can figure out like the how many different combinations you could get with 26 letters and 10 digits, right? It's a lot. Um, but it tells you who made this commit. It tells you uh, when it was made um, and it provides the commit message, right? So what we would expect is what? When we make the next commit, what's the behavior we would expect when we type git log? Yeah. Yeah, there should just be another entry, right? Okay. Okay, so let's go through that and and try. So what I'd like you to do is um, try on your own to get through um, the next, uh, get through Let's see. Actually, yeah, get through right uh, right here. Okay, so this should take maybe like three-ish minutes, right? But all you have to do is you're gonna add one more line to that mars.txt file and you're gonna type git status, okay? And it should tell you again that you have untracked changes. Okay. Let's see. Like more Mars. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So I think that um uh I how about I do my next connection then. Okay. No, you can install Nano for Mac, but Vim is always. Yeah, I think it's Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll I'll go through the next one. Yeah. And then um yeah. Well I'm doing work, but I don't have to do the Oh um it works now. So, so, that, so that like more space or more space Mars dot Oh, you're on the PC. Um, type it down. Okay. Yeah, I think that 
I think you don't have to worry about that. He was just like a warning saying that like Don Nano wants you to be um like a profile file for um for nano. So we have like all your preferences in there and it seems like it's just yeah, you can just ignore it. Okay, so for the sake of those that are interested in um, going down the Vim rabbit hole, I'm going to use I'm going to use Vim um, or VI to to update my file. So that's the nice thing about um, doing this in Bash, the command line. You can actually go between. There's no reason, right? It's just like opening a file in Notepad versus like WordPad or right, like opening in two different text editors. You can bounce between text editors, and that's totally fine. If you started in Nano, you're not committed to Nano, right? If you decide to become like an Emacs guru. That's totally fine. You can always, and truthfully, um, a lot of the folks that I know that use Emacs or 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 only do, do their development like in in these kinds of like text editors, um, right? They they have different purposes for different things, right? So Vim is the thing that you use if you need to change one character really quickly. Emacs is something if you need to find and replace, right? Thousands of if you need to rename rename a variable throughout a whole piece of code. Um, but I'm going to use BIM and I'm going to talk through what I'm going to do because it's not going to, um, it's less, it's less apparent on BIM exactly how to do things. Okay. So what we have to do here is we have to add another line of text. And so to do that in BIM, I'm going to say VI Mars.txt. And so here's my original text here. I, you can see my cursor. So it's still cold and dry but everything is my favorite color. And now I need to insert the text that says the two moons may be a problem for Wolfman. Okay, so the way that I enter insert mode in Vim is just by hitting the I character once. So I'll type I, and then I'm just in kind of regular addition mode, right? I can say the two moons, may be a problem for Wolfman, okay? Now to get out of, um, uh, to get out of insert mode, I can always hit, I hit escape button, the escape button once. You can see the status here, it's in insert mode and I'm gonna hit escape. And now that insert mode went away and I'm no longer, I can see my cursor, but if I, if I typed something, if I try to type something, um, it wouldn't insert, okay? All right, so why is Vim sometimes helpful? Well, um, a couple of reasons. One is that it provides some more advanced kind of key bindings or keystrokes that do pretty powerful things. Right, one is I can just erase a single character with the X command. So if I wanna erase this W, I just cursor over to it before I'm at W and I type X and it'll remove the um, that character. Okay, if I cursor over the whole word and type D, uh, that's not it, um, escape. Uh, I don't remember what deleting a word is, but there is one. Um, I can nuke the whole line by just typing DD, right? So now the whole line is gone, okay, right? But now I have to retype it again. So to do that, I type I to re-enter insert and say the two moons may be a problem for wolf. 
All right, now when I'm ready to save, I want to leave insert mode. So I type escape. And I'm going to hit shift in the colon. And that's going to allow me to enter control mode here. So it puts a colon down here and the flashing cursor is now down here. And I want to tell Vim to save the file. So I can type W and hit enter. So it saved the file, but now if I want to leave Vim, I need to tell it to quit, right? And so, um, so again, I need to enter control mode and I hit, hit, hit Q. If I had added more text, um, I, could, I could chain those commands together, right? So I could type WQ and Vim will interpret this as write, then quit, okay? Okay, so now again, if I use cat to look at that, Okay, so that second line is now in, in my text file. Okay, good. All right, so what I wanna do now is, uh, again, in Git, what do we do to see where we're at? Git status. Okay, this is what we should have expected, right? Okay, it says now there are untracked changes. Um, a pretty cool thing that I can do is I can type, okay, well, what is the difference between these changes and previous ones? And it said, well, here's, here's kind of what the difference is, right? So what it did is it did, um, a, a difference on two different versions of Mars.txt. One that is already in my Git repository and one that is right now untracked, right? And so um, you can see here that the B version here is the one where there are additions to it, right? So that's what these pluses indicate. And what's really cool here is that when it does this diff, it shows you where the insertions are, right? It says you added in this file this text here, right? Okay. So when I did that git diff, it just said, hey, here's, here's how these two things differ. Here's how your code base differs from what is already in the repository, okay? All right, so um, okay, so let's go ahead and see. Let's go ahead and, and commit this change, right? So, what's the command for committing a change? Git commit minus m, and add concerns about effects. Moons on Wolfman. Ooh. Okay, what did it do? What happened? What what did you say, Zara? Right. I those changes were un, unstaged, right? They were not staged for committing. Right, so I need to go back and I need to get add. And I can just use period again. Okay, I got this warning about line endings, whatever. Um, get, what do I wanna check now maybe? Check the status. Okay, so now something is staged, mars.txt is staged again. and it's ready to be committed, right? So now I can just use my up arrow and find that git commit command, hit enter, okay? And now if I check this out, 
right? I have a different number. And it has my commit message. Okay. So how can I check the status of all of my commits again? What was the command? Yeah. Git log, right? So if I type git log. Okay, so and what is the order in which these commits are shown? The most recent commits at the top, right? So it has the author, and if you take a look here, that hash is still, my first hash is still the same, right? I don't exactly remember the seven characters, but those seem approximately correct. Correct. There were some A's and B's. Now I have another hash for this other, another identifier for this most recent commit, okay? Okay. So where do we go from here? Um, so I want you to go ahead and read through um, this text about the staging area. And go through until you can get um, this third commit. See if you can't practice this skill for adding another, yet another line of code about the humidity for mummy. Wait. Oh, mummy will, will appreciate. I was like, wait, they're not bemoaning the lack of humidity for mummy, I hope. Um, so go through and see if you can get to the point where you have these three um, commit logs when you type git log. Okay. And then when you have, um, when you're ready, post your blue sticky notes if you have them. And actually, we are we're almost at the end of class. And so just read through. And once you have those three um, entries on your Git log, then feel free to go ahead and depart for the day. Um, th so the first programming assignment, we'll be having you make a repository. I'll post this um, to the Canvas page today. Um, all you're going to be doing is creating a repository for the class, adding a markdown file um, that contains kind of what your goals for the semester are, and a little bit more about where your research intersects with computational science, um, and then committing that to GitHub. And you'll you'll turn in the location of that repository. I'll send out that poll. We'll make sure that you have enough time to do that, such that we'll have a pizza party and work on remotes then, okay?